Hello, um, welcome to week 28, episode 28 of My Week at the Club. This is Roger Capello, um, bringing you the action from the chess board at the Wachusett Chess Club in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Uh, and this week I played a, an interesting, albeit uh, a little painful for me, game against uh, Jeff Lepore. Actually, it wasn't this week, it was a week ago Wednesday on the 18th of January. Um, it was... Uh, a problem this this week making the video. I had everything all set about a week or so ago to do the recording and discovered that the update of the recording software wasn't working. And we were about to take a trip down south and I didn't have time to get it all uh, debugged and uh, recorded before I left. So I'm doing a little later than I would have liked. So this uh, game is actually about you know, 11 or 12 days old now, I guess. But um, it is what it is. Uh, first, I would like to um, let you uh, bring to your bring to your attention the the astronomy. Um, let's see, order my windows a little here. Um, the astronomy picture in the uh, middle there below Jeff, um, and this this sort of an interesting picture that was snapped about two weeks ago by uh, the Cassini spacecraft um, in orbit around Saturn. They seem to be putting out a lot of pictures these days because Cassini's uh, entering the last uh, last several months of its mission, I guess, and then it's going to plunge into the Saturn atmosphere. But what this is is the moon uh, called Daphnis. It's a small little moon there. It's about five miles in diameter, and it's inside of the ring system out in the A ring, uh, inside of a gap in the ring system. And what I find fascinating about this is that, as you can see, it actually causes waves in the rings. So it perturbs the rings as it goes around. And this photo doesn't show it too well, but uh, if you look at it more edge on, you can see in some other photos that these waves are actually up out of the plane of the ring, out of the rings themselves. So the rings are comprised of little um, chunks of uh, snowy ice, uh, anywhere from snowball to snowman size. They're, they're fairly small and, and fairly thin uh, ring, not, and not um, Although it looks dense to your eyes, it's uh, not as um, uh, fully f filled uh, as you might think that it is. And as Daphnis goes through this gap, it's causing these waves. And the waves on the uh, leading side, you just see a, a little glimmer of one here right, right there, um, actually go ahead of Daphnis because their they're, uh, lower Saturn is at the top of the picture in this um, photo that has been taken here. And that's the direction it is. And those waves uh, in the ring orbit faster than the uh, moon does, so that they actually go forward of where the moon is. And the waves uh, out here, the, which look like bigger ones here, are actually trailing waves back behind the uh, moon. And they're up out of the plane of the orbit of the ring system because the uh, orbits of the moon is inclined slightly. It's about one three hundredth of a degree of inclination quite small, but at that radius from Saturn, that translates to about on the order of uh, five miles, eight, eight kilometers, something like that, and about the same as the distance, uh, about the size of the gap here. So sometimes the moon is above the plane of the rings and sometimes it's below the plane of the rings, and that's why it causes these waves to be generated out of the um, plane of the ring system. Okay, on to the chess. Enough astronomy. I know you're not all necessarily budding astronomers. So I played a, a game this week in, in a, a deep pawn opening that is the uh, um, ChessX software here says it, it classified it as Neo Benoni, but it was really a fairly irregular opening and that's something that I recognized. After I played D4, Jeff immediately challenged me in the center with C5. Um, you know, there are various responses you might consider that. I decided to just go ahead and maintain my center uh, with a C pawn, which is a fairly stable structure and it looks like it's not too ambitious but I wanted to build up a, a big pawn center if I could. Um, Jeff's next move developed which made a lot of sense with knight f6. I developed my knight and then he played knight c6 and this was a provocation um, because he's in some sense daring me to go ahead and push the d pawn uh, and get into maybe some Benoni type structure. Um, I went ahead and did that. Of course, that's overextending my pawn a bit, but it's um, 
I thought it very likely was forcing him to uh, play knight b8, that any other move um, would be bad for him. The, the only move that doesn't immediately lose material would be knight to a5. Um, and that's what he did. <laughs> Uh, that was a bit of a surprise to me because I thought that the knight, well, not only is it not well placed on the side of the board, but it's, it can come under um, uh, attack very easily. So, for example, if I had time to move my e-pawn and control this c4 square, then his knight would have nowhere to go. So if I played, uh, well, as, I, as it just moved for me up to b4, um, if he couldn't go to the c4 square, the knight would be lost. And so my thinking was back here was at first was, well, I'll figure out a way to bring c4 under my control and then play b4. Um, but if I did that, he would have time to move his b pawn up here and uh, retreat his knight through d7. So instead, I immediately played b4. And he traded off the pair of pawns and then played the knight into c4. Again, it's his only move. But of course, it's. Um, it's not defended there, and it's uh, again starting to be uh, rather overextended itself, and starting to look like there might be tactics involved. So I played e4, um, and of course this attacks the knight by uh, discovering the attack of my bishop here along a, a light square diagonal. So he doesn't have time to take my pawn on uh, e4, even though it's undefended. So what he did was defend the knight with his pawn. He could also have done it, perhaps, with the queen to c7, but uh, then his queen would have been on, a, on an exposed square where I might have done something on the c file. Um, after he did this, I looked at it for a while and decided that uh, I really needed to get something developed um, and support my center a bit more. So I played knight to c3 um, rather than going in for any more immediate tactics. And he surprised me, but then by playing his bishop out to a6. Um, it didn't, I didn't really see it coming to that square. Uh, it's true that the pawn on b5 here um, was attacked by my knight. Um, I'm not sure I would want to have taken it because uh, in many cases it might have just been a trade of that b pawn for my valuable pawn on e4 here, which, uh, which, which my knight is defending. And so I didn't really see that as a threat. And so in some sense, this was another provocation, putting the bishop out there where it's undefended and might fall prey to some tactics. So right away, I started looking at some ways that I might succeed in doing that. And what I came up with was to play e5. And his knight right now has, uh, again, has not very many good squares it can go to. Um, he chose to play to g4. And then this allowed a, a little combination of um, exchanging off that knight that was on c4 and then press, pushing forward with my e-pawn. Now, the reason I exchange off the knight, if you go back a few moves here, is that if I push my e-pawn forward immediately, um, then he would have the possibility of just moving one of his knights. Um, Let's see, not clear which one. Maybe this knight uh, to defend the d7 and f7 squares. Something like that. Um, so instead, what I did was to tr of the, of that is to first exchange off that knight and then, and then push the pawn to e6. And of course, the threat is twofold, either to uh, possibly to take on d7. Um, and if he takes back with the queen, um, well, that's, that's, that's actually a possibility. That's, that's not too bad for him. That's kind of what I expected him to do uh, if, by moving his f pawn. But instead, what, so, and the other, the, the, what, I, what I consider the main threat, the real threat here in this position, was to play e takes f7. And I thought he had to do something about that threat. Um, what, he did do something about the threat, but it, I didn't think that this was a possibility because it loses a piece. I just come out to a4 check. Um, he only has one move other than giving the bishop away for free, is to block with the queen, and then I just take the bishop. So I've won a, a piece right now for a pawn, one pawn, and he immediately takes my d pawn. So now it's a, a piece for two pawns. And 
White is, um, I think, should be winning in this position. Um, Jeff said he was, after the game, that he was um, not too unhappy with going into this line because he'd been considering some lines in which he was going to sacrifice this knight on g4 for my pawn on uh, f2 anyhow. And so he had a piece sack in mind. And uh, so he went ahead and uh, went ahead and allowed this line. Now, now if I had played it right, though, I, I think I'm analyzing it after the fact, and of course with uh, help of my uh, stockfish program. I'm convinced that you know this is a winning position for White. I just didn't do the the right continuation, and I realized when I went into this line that those connected past pawns on the C and D pawns could be dangerous here, um, and I was thinking that I could restrain them, but uh, they don't really do a good job of restraining them. And the best move at this point would have been, instead of what I played, um, would have been to play an immediate h3. And if I do that, uh, the reason this is good is that it chases his knight back um, to a, you know, some square. f6 is probably the most reasonable square for him at this point. He, Point is he can't go he can't go through um, through e5 right now because I have that under control with my knight. So uh, if if his knight gets attacked, he has to drop it back to either f6 or h6. f6 probably being better. And then uh, I could continue with knight to e5 attacking his queen. And then the queen has to leave that light square diagonal with a move like queen to d6, uh, queen e6. Sorry. And, um, and now that opens him up for a check. Uh, the only thing he can do that doesn't, well, he can move his king to d8, but that's um, not a very appealing option at this point. Um, the other possibility is to block with his knight on d7. And after blocking with the knight on d7, um, there are various possibilities, but one is just to go, forcing line is just to go ahead and take with the queen, and he has to take back. Um, I take the queen with my knight, he takes the king, so we've traded a pair of knights and a pair of queens, but at the end of all this, I win the d-pawn, and now his c-pawn is passed, but it's isolated and very weak, and I shouldn't have any trouble winning that, and his, uh, this is a pretty easily won endgame for white, I believe. Instead, back in this position, instead of kicking the knight away with h3, I, instead I played a significantly weaker move, I think, in queen b5. So the reason I did that was um, I was a little worried that the queen was going to be supporting his past pawns, I guess. And I thought if I could force the trade of queens off, that I, with my minor pieces, I would be able to keep restrain his pawns from advancing. It wasn't a losing move. I mean, white still is um, in much better shape here, but uh, it's not nearly as easy as that last continuation that we looked at. So after I played queen to b5, Jeff, of course, didn't. I would have been happy if he had traded queens off and advanced my knight. Uh, but of course, he didn't do that. Instead, he uh, opened up uh, a line for his bishop, meanwhile defending his d-pawn, um, and also putting an attack here on, uh, on my b4. And I have to do something about that. I didn't see much else other than to take the time to uh, reinforce it with a3. Um, again, though, I, I, had, I could have ignored that immediate threat and played h3. Um, and if I had done that, uh, let's see here, OK, then we get into a somewhat similar line to before. Um, if he trades off queens, um, I take back and now he's, you know, I'm threatening the fork on c7. Um, he can take the, my pawn, check, but I interpose with the bishop. He trades off the uh, bishops. Yeah, really, this isn't very similar to the other line. I, I was thinking of a different, um, different variation. And then he can just retreat the knight to f6. But 
I have at the tail end of all this, I pick up an exchange with knight to c7 check. Um, what I, sorry, the variation that, that I was thinking of was um, was okay, not not here. Uh, that can't show it to you easily. Okay, so after um, I played a3 defending my pawn, he developed a bishop to d6, and all, now all of a sudden I started getting worried here because his pieces are coming alive and mine aren't. I decided to, um, again, not to trade off the queens because uh, that would just bring his king to the center where it could support his pawns. Instead, I thought it was paramount that I get developed as quickly as I can, even though he's starting to get a lead in development. So I played bishop to b2, um, but his moves come very easily. Uh, he played f6, which now bolsters that e5 square and uh, makes a nice safe square for his knight to uh, retreat to. And finally, at this point, is when I uh, attacked and drove that knight back. Um, he played his knight to e5. And it's, um, you know, it's strongly posted. I didn't want it coming in. Well, there's a, an immediate threat here of, of knight to d3 check winning my bishop. But um, even if I do something to, uh, to ensure that this bishop isn't lost to a fork, I didn't want to allow his knight to come into this strong post on d3. So I traded the knights off. And after I traded the knights off, um, now his bishop is threatening to capture my knight with check, and that would win the queen. So I have to do something about that threat. So I actually am more or less forced to trade off queens at this point which I did, and played knight a4, offering uh, the bishop trade, because I was uh, in this position right here, I was feeling that the, um, that, that, my, that, that I was, uh, this, this construction was um, awkward over on the queen side. So this, this knight is actually pinned to the bishop. I could defend the bishop. Um, but even so, it's, it's, he's sort of the one in the driver's seat. I wanted to resolve that situation. So by the maneuver knight to a4, offering the bishop trade, then after the bishop takes, knight takes, um, I've resolved all the pin issues over there. The problem, of course, is that this gives his pawns free reign to advance, which is what he does. And at this point, I play the dubious move of knight to d3. What I should have done, instead, you know, that looked reasonable to me because that's centralizing the knight and I'm think, I was thinking about blockading the pawns. But what I should have done at this point was to play the knight to a4. And the computer pointed this out to me. And this is actually quite an easy forcing line. I just didn't look at it. So I'm attacking the pawn. It has to be defended. Um, the natural way to defend it is with the d-pawn. Um, if he doesn't, I could attack it. With the rook. Um, so, he, so he defends it with the d-pawn. Um, I then attack that d-pawn. Uh, it has to be defended with the pawn coming up. Uh, and then I can take the, pawn, the uh, c-pawn because the d-pawn is pinned. So it's quite an you know, easy line here with a valuation of plus 1.7. The line I didn't look at, I'm just looking at the scene right now while I was talking. Um, maybe I did look at it in the game and I've forgotten. Um, sorry, let's go back. Um, after, a little further back. After I take the c-pawn, if instead of defending with the um, d-pawn, what would happen if he had played rook to b8? Ah, long square, rook to c8, there it is. Um, defending that pawn. Well, let's see, we still have the possibility of, say, of going check. Um, say the king comes up, I could then have attacked the c-pawn. He could have, um, this isn't doing exactly what I wanted because he could advance the d-pawn the, uh, and defend it. And 
Um, it looks like it's getting held. So let's cheat a little bit here in interest of time. Then turn on the engine and see what's happening. Um, if he tried to defend with the rook, ah, interesting. I didn't even consider that. Okay, so with the line that the computer liked and why it was suggesting coming up with the v-pawn originally was to castle long. And that puts pressure along the d-file, makes this d-pawn not a good defender, and also threatens to move my king up to uh, immediately um, threaten to win this c-pawn. So that, that would have been a good move. I didn't, didn't think of that. Okay, well, computers have a way of coming up with those. So instead I played knight to d3. After knight to d3, um, that gave him time then to advance uh, his pawn mass in the center. Um, and now I played what, what was really a weak move, attacking the c-pawn with my rook. Now, as you can see, the computer here is also saying that uh, I should go ahead and castle. And in this line, if I follow it through, I'll just go ahead and click through it quickly. Um, the computer played this sequence of moves so that the uh, so that it really restrained these central pawns um, with f3, which keeps the e pawn from advancing. My knight is blockading nicely. So the rook and pawn stop, stop the e-pawn from advancing. And then uh, move later, um, the g-pawn is used to keep the f-pawn from the base of the pawns from moving. So it's, uh, it's much cleverer about restraining the central pawns than the line that I chose, which was instead to attack the c-pawn. I mean, that, that's weak because it just encourages him to um, set up that pawn chain along the dark squares. And now I'm having a hard time doing anything about that. And I tried to disrupt it with f4 when perhaps uh, even in this position f3 would have been better. Although now my king is on that file, so it's, it's a little harder to keep that d-pawn from advancing. Instead I played f4 and uh, he just simply chose that as an opportune time to move his king forward. I traded off the pawns and brought my king forward. This king came, stepped in a little further, and now I have to start worrying about the um, possibility of his king coming in over here and invading uh, on my uh, queen side. And so I um, went ahead and got my knight on a more active post, um, also opened up a, a square for my king to get into on d3. But he didn't give me time to go ahead and do that maneuver. Instead, he played a5. Um, I should point out, I noticed, I, I wrote it down in my notes here, that, that knight c5 was the first time that uh, the evaluation went negative in the game, that the computer thought that black had the lead. So even up to this point, before I played knight c5, it, it still I uh, was happy. It thought the game was even if I had played uh, my other rook, the h rook, to d1, centralized it, which, you know, looking at it now after the fact, that does seem quite reasonable. So instead I played my knight to c5, and he, that gave him a chance to play a4, and now he's getting play on the queen side, which I've abandoned by putting my rook over on this um, inactive square on c1. I mean, it's not totally inactive. It's keeping the pawn from advancing um, too far. But it, given that there's uh, now three connected past pawns, it's, a, it's not a, at all a good blockader. Rooks are not good blockaders. You want to have them be active. And my, act, my rook is certainly not very active where it is. So he played a5. I stepped in with my king to uh, try to keep his king out of the light squares and also to allow to allow the, uh, I was thinking about posting my knight up on e4 at that point. He traded off the pawns and came down to a2. And now I made a, uh, a, a blunder. Um, what I should have done at this point uh, is to play uh, knight to e4 um, 
and that would have uh, gone ahead and established that blockade that I was looking at getting before on, on uh, light squares. But the reason I didn't do that is because I was afraid he would win the G-pawn. But it turns out this G-pawn is really not something that he would want to take. Um, but I, I wasn't thinking actively enough. So the computer suggested the line of uh, rook a1. And then after the uh, sensible move of attacking my loose pawn on uh, b4, um, my rook gets very active. It's threatening checkmate right now on uh, d6. Um, the counter would have to counter that with uh, either moving the rook to the d file or moving this what, he, what the computer says here, the rook to the sixth rank. Then white can check and drive the king out of uh, the um, protection of the pawns there. And then my king can uh, step in forward. And all of a sudden, you know, if you follow through on this line, I won't go through the whole line because it's, it could have gone a different way. But there are, white is getting much more active in this variation than in the game. In the game, uh, well, in the game, it's not only a question of activity, it's actually a blunder because after I made this move, I looked at the position and I saw clearly what he could do. And, of course, um, Jeff didn't miss it. And, of course, the, pro the problem is that he can just play uh, e4 check. And I can't abandon my rook. That, you know, if I play king to e2, he just takes my rook with check. So I have to take the pawn with my knight, but then he trades the rooks off. My king is overworked then. He trades the rooks off and ends up taking my knight. And basically, the knight has been traded for one pawn. Um, a little while ago, I was, when I first started realizing that I might be worse in the game, I uh, was looking for ways to trade my knight off for two pawns. And I never did get that chance. And trading it for one pawn is just not enough in this position because the remaining two pawns, uh, since they're connected and passed, are just too much for me. I thought that um, you know, with, with this check driving the king back, that you know maybe I was getting a decent position here when my king comes forward. But Jeff thought for quite a while here and came up with a, a little idea, little plan that worked out quite well. And that's that he would attack my b pawn. Um, the only way I can defend it now is to move my rook over to the b file, and now he gains the e file, and is threatening to come in with a strong check on uh, e3. I have really nothing to do at this point, so I started pushing my passed pawn, hoping that there would be uh, something would come out of it. But he comes in with the check. My king moves back. And now his king steps forward, supporting his pawns. And my, my life is um, not going to be too long for the white army in this position. And actually, Stockfish already sees uh, that there's a checkmate in eight moves. And I looked at it for a while and didn't see anything that looked at all good, so I resigned. Um, the problem is that, you know, the, what's coming very, not, there's no way to resist this idea of d3 check. And then my king comes back, then uh, the other pawn comes to c2, and he's going to be checkmating me and or um, getting a queen and then checkmating me a few moves later. So this, in this hopeless position, I resigned. Um, it was uh, a disappointing game because I was convinced in the coming out of the opening that I had a winning position, um, and I think rightfully so. So, you know, at this point, uh, White was still winning the game, um, but I mis really mishandled the transition here and should have kept the queens on the board. His, his king is not as safe as mine is, and what I ended up doing was uh, giving him a very easy path toward getting his pawns to be a, a coherent mass that could march forward. So, such is the game of chess, and uh, I'll come back again. Uh, this week will be the, actually the last round, be the fifth round. Um, I'm not sure who I'm, I'll p schedule play. Uh, I think maybe Brett Kildall. Uh, oddly enough, even though I don't have very many points, uh, I might get paired up against Brett, who's uh, just about at the master level now. So, uh, that should be an interesting game, at least uh, it'll be another instructive game for me, perhaps.
So, so long. See you next week. Bye-bye.